Live from New York, it's theCUBE, covering Big Data NYC 2015. Brought to you by Hortonworks, IBM, EMC, and Pivotal. Now, your hosts, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Welcome back to New York City, everybody. This is theCUBE. We're here at Strata and Hadoop World. This is our event within the event. This is Big Data NYC. Ron Bodkin is back. He's the founder and president of Think Big Analytics. Ron, good to see you again. We were talking just off camera. It's been, been just about a year since the Teradata acquisition. So, uh, yeah. so how's it going? Well, uh, we haven't completed our assimilation of Teradata after our acquisition of them, but we're making good progress. <laughs> you know, we're definitely <laughs> seeing... <laughs> Okay. <laughs> We're definitely seeing a lot of uh, enthusiasm inside Teradata for the opportunity that big data really presents, right? That Teradata's got all these great assets around uh, managing data, you know, more maturity around data management and so much depth in analytics. And so all of those assets combined with our DNA of uh, DevOps and software architecture and big, the big data world, uh, you know, there's a lot of synergy, there's a lot of power. And so we're pretty excited about collaborating and, and bringing coherent approaches to help customers solve big data s problems with real solutions, right? I mean, at Think Big, we always have had a strategy of helping customers build high value applications with big data. Those high value applications tend to be unique to their business, using their data sets, the way they interact with customers and products, and you know, they're not a packaged out of the box thing, instead it's high value for, for companies that really leverage data. So I think we've put together, you know, with us joining Teradata, all kidding aside, um, that we, we really bring uh, a, a complete package for why we're the best provider for those analytic solutions. Well, we were joking, but uh, I can think of many, many examples having been in this industry a long time where large companies buy small companies and then pollute the small companies, stamp out the DNA, and then they just not really don't get the value out of it. That's not happening, I'm inferring. Um, so why, What's the, wh how did that happen? Was it just sort of Teradata embraced what you were doing? They're sort of you know, leaning into what you're doing or they, a lot of times successful ac acquisitions, are, they leave you alone. It doesn't sound like it's a leave you alone type of strategy. Can you describe the dynamic? Yeah, I mean, I think it's more like bringing, uh, that, that we brought a you know, very complimentary capability, right? Teradata, like we talked about in the, in the mm. last session earlier, invest a lot in this concept of the unified data architecture, being able to put together a best-in-class data warehouse and discovery tools and uh, data platforms, i.e. Hadoop, and now real-time processing. But we bring with the, our depth in, in Hadoop and Spark and Kafka and so forth, all, all this capability to execute the data lakes, the analytics in Hadoop, the streaming real-time analytics that really complement a lot of the capabilities that Teradata is best in class in, you know, discovery with Aster, or data warehouse with Hadoop, or sorry, with uh, Teradata data warehouse. Um, so, you know, I think, I think the, the reason why we joined was because they saw our capabilities and the ability to drive solutions in the big data space is critical to that unified data architecture that, they, that customers had told Teradata it was really critical to them, right? So we brought a, a really complementary part of the picture. And that's why we have, there's an important element of how we keep our own brand and mission, right? we remain independent consultants, we're not incented to sell Teradata appliances, but at the same time, we collaborate on building bigger solutions, drawing on the skills and expertise inside of uh, the Teradata parent company. You were talking about your expertise in building high value apps. Can we talk about some of those apps? Sure. I mean, you know, everybody thinks about fraud detection. I, I, I know, you know, customer churn comes up a lot, things of that nature. What are those high value apps? And, and, and let's talk about how they're maturing. Absolutely, so, so certainly those are, are ones that we've had experience in. Those two identify you know, various marketing applications. Um, that's, you know, I think a lot of people know about that use of. Sure big data to get deeper insight into consumer behavior, and we do a fair bit of that work. But I think, we, you know, maybe I'll start with a different kind, which, uh, you know, I, when we started Think Big, I didn't anticipate being so big, which is Internet of Things, device data, right, that we've done a lot of work over the years, and the first customers in that space were high-tech manufacturing companies, you know, companies that had div uh, data center gear that they would send out to, uh, to run at distributed locations around the world and collect petabytes of phone home data, which will typically be data around the configuration of the device 
It'd be information about sensor readings, it'd be information about alerts around what's going wrong, you know, any error conditions or problems that the system's encountering. So we did projects like, a couple of big projects like that. We've done um, a number of projects for high-tech manufacturers on yield improvement using massive amounts of test data throughout the, uh, the life cycle of products, uh, R&D, um, QA, scaling up production deployment, and then even customer service. And what's exciting is now we're starting to see uh, a next phase where those are being applied not only um, inside of the high-tech manufacturing vertical, but we're seeing customers in other areas embrace these. So we're starting to see device data. Several of our insurance customers are working with telematics data and we're helping them with that. You know, to be able to do things like determine driving, driver behavior based on the way people are actually driving cars and correlating it with other information like traffic patterns and weather that can inform whether you know, if somebody brakes hard, that might be a, a sign, normally it's a sign of a, a poor driver, right? They, they brake hard, but if there is, uh, if they're avoiding an accident that others are hitting things, and they, that's, they're a good driver because they broke hard, right? right. So, um, so, so squinting through that. Yeah, sort of pulling together those kind of complex signals, right? And anyway, so we're helping customers with that. We're helping with um, use cases like uh, we ha are working with a um, large medical device manufacturer around really helping them deliver integrated health outcomes, but there's a ton of data from those medical devices, managing it, doing analytics, and delivering it to really have an impact on health outcomes. Right, so that we've done a lot of work around device data, machine data, Internet of Things, mm. um, as well as you know, advertising applications, personalization, doing deep analytics to understand the consumer. Right, so we, those are all application areas that are that we've done a lot of work. You and, know. and and bigger than you said, bigger than you thought it would be. The yeah, IoT piece. it was. You know, we've seen a lot of you know, big, you know significant value for consumers using it. Of course, any consumer-facing business, you know, has a lot of value from big data in, in understanding consumer behavior. We've seen a lot of that in the financial services sector, whether it be you know, banks or brokerages or um, insurance companies. Right, that there's a payment processors, right? We've been working with a range of financial services companies around consumer behavior data, as well as retailers and media companies and online companies as well. So, uh, I want to ask you a question about the sort of high-tech manufacturing companies and, the, and the, the, the business outcome of, that they were looking for was just Im Im improving, you know, be being proactive on service or just better visibility on potential failures or? So, so I think there, there's some different ones. One, one, has, one big one is improving the yield in the manufacturing process, speeding up time to market, mm -hmm. right? As you can imagine in a high tech market where a product life cycle is often less than 24 months, you know, from launch till the product's obsolete. Um, if you can get to market a month early, it has a big impact both on your profitability, but also on your market share. Um, by improving quality and improving your reputation, it, it improves market share as well. And there's a significant waste. You know, with lower yield, there's a lot of scrap that gets thrown out that adds a lot of cost. So mm. that's big. You know, part of it is just enabling engineers to use big data techniques to better understand the problem domain, right? We, our customers that are, are now mature and using big data at scale are discovering all kinds of things that their old approaches of sampling data and using small approximate data sets were missing, right? So they're getting smarter, they're getting more proactive about the analytics, and you know, it's letting their engineers spend more time engineering and less time troubleshooting and running down problems. And, and of those applications that you talked about, did they all involve uh, some real-time nature or some of them? Can you talk about that? Yeah, so I think that there's uh, a maturity curve that companies typically, I mean, th th there's a lot of enthusiasm for real-time in the market, right? And, and so there's a lot of sizzle around it and you know, often associated with um, the latest uh, uh, hype technology, right? So a couple years ago, people were really excited about Storm and now people are excited about Spark streaming. And you know, there's value in those technologies and we work with Spark a lot, including streaming. But uh, I think that a lot of times people reach for, for some of these real-time and streaming engines where it's not that big a deal for the use case. You know, there's a lot of times when we talk to our customers, they say, oh, we want this in real time. We say, well, what does that mean to you? What, what's, what's, how, how slow? If you say, if you, if you had it you know, you know, in an hour, would that be valuable? Oh yeah, that would be real time to us, right? A lot of organizations that are you know, dealing with slow overnight batch windows that bleed into the next day, 
getting data even early the next morning is real time, right. but, or an hour or five minutes. Right? In fact, I think what you see is almost always when a human's in the loop looking at the data and making decisions, uh, true real time analytics isn't, um, isn't very important right? in terms of having data from the last moment. Having fast results when you're doing an analysis is incredibly valuable, that's a form of real time. Um, but, you know, it, so when you are doing a, executing a business process, right? If you're serving a web page, you know, d diagnosing a trouble code from a device that's phoning in, uh, your call center agent's talking to somebody and they, they get a, a cue uh, about what to do. Real time there is important, right? To be able to, so that's a more mature level of adoption where you're now not just doing decision support analytics with big data, but you're actually building machine learned models to automate a process. Real time is important there. However, in that case, there's a lot of scenarios where simpler architectures that don't involve streaming are perfectly adequate, right? You store a certain amount of state about what's going on in the interaction and when uh, that happens, like, okay, the, the, this consumer just browse to the sports section. So we should record in their profile that they're, they're currently looking for something around sports. That'll help us if we generate offers for them, right? So that kind of thing, there's a small amount of state. You can use a, a database, a NoSQL database or otherwise. You don't necessarily need to farm it out over a whole distributed network to process that. So you know, there's, there's the right tool for the job. I think sometimes that's the, the challenge is that there's too much, there's so much new technology in the big data space. It's overwhelming for a lot of our customers, a lot of people in the industry, our you know, businesses. And you know, it's, it's knowing the right tool for the right job. What are the different kinds of real time? When do I want uh, a scalable micro batch approach? Right? There's a lot of those kinds of questions that you know, things are moving too fast for the knowledge to generally settle in that everybody has, you know, there's a common accepted approach that's, that's well understood. So do you think this, this, all this discussion about, oh, trying to change the outcome, you know, before you lose the customer, or that, that's how many people define real time, is it a little bit overblown right now? Um, you mentioned micro batch, which is kind of, Spark is sort of a mm -hmm. micro batch scalable architecture, right? Is this you know, yeah. good enough? Or maybe give us some perspective on that. Is this sort of a lot of marketing hype, or is, are you actually seeing real use cases where? Yes. Yeah, real time, real time where you're actually changing an outcome for a user, personalizing, driving a specific um, outcome based on a model um, is a reasonable thing to do. Uh, you know, that is, that's, that's that process execution use case I was talking about where you're, you're in the middle of some business process and you want to have real time data about, you know, reflecting everything that just happened. Uh, to, to make a recommendation or to guide a human interaction, human human interaction. So th th that we're doing that, we, we've done that for a while. I mean, you know, the, one of the first things I ever did uh, in big data prior to starting Think Big, I was the VP engineering of a company called Quantcast, and we had a look-alike business where we would in real time figure out for this given person looking at this piece of content at this time, do they look like someone who's likely to buy any one of a number of advertising advertisers' products so we could tailor an ad for the right um, campaign, right? That was a real-time execution use case, the process execution, right? So there's good uses for it, but I just point out that a lot of times people are wanting to do more decision support human analytics yeah. where it's not so important, and even within that, a lot of times the architecture to support real-time doesn't have to be something complicated like a, a distributed streaming system. You could have a, a much simpler architecture. Well, we always say, you know, you can't take the humans out of the equation. M maybe you actually can. There are more and more use cases, but there's still, humans are involved in a lot of situations. But I want to try to take it back to maybe some things that our audience can relate to in, in, in the context of real time. I mean, I think of fraud detection, and I get, you know, pinged half a day later when I've made a transaction, you know, just the other day you know, on a plane and made a transaction, got a fraud detection alert that said, did you do a fast food transaction yesterday? I'm like, no, I started to do no. And I'm like, wait a minute. Could that have been, you know, on a plane? Yeah. Sort of just missed the, yeah, that's the a, example. That, that's a good you know, example where, where it, real time is valuable, right? You're in the yeah. middle of a process, so getting, getting alert is close to real time then. Um, is a lot more valuable. But they, but they negated well, the transaction, and so now it's right. So yeah. that, and that happens. So there's, you get a lot of false positives, or false negatives, I guess, in that case. And so it seems like there's a long way to go with regard to you know, the quality of real time. Is that fair? Um, well, I, I mean, I, I think that 
people are not uniformly executing real time well, right? To your point, I mean, can I you think help? My, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, we. I we, mean, that example I gave. Could you help solve that problem? Absolutely. Say, Look, guys, yeah. We can actually improve the feedback to the customer so that he or she can respond accurately, so they don't have to make three phone calls or think about it for a half hour and yeah i mean we know, we, we did a, we did a project negatives. with a large uh, financial payment processor uh -huh. that was all about modernizing and uh, fraud detection right so making it easier to to quickly to test out new new ways i mean that's a good example of your point you can't take these people out of the equation there was a blend of machine learning but human curation of rules and trying things out simulating them right. testing them and then executing them in real time, right? So we built the whole Hadoop backend to power that. And you know, there's a front end, a, an in-memory database, so for incredible speed in a real time way that you can block a transaction. Everyone's got the ability to block transactions in real time, yeah, right? Yeah. But then you also want to have the ability, you have to, but then you have the ability to tie it into a, a backend system where you can act alert efficiently on it. Right, excellent. All right, listen, Ron, we're out of time. Thank you very much for right. coming back Thanks, on. Thanks, Dave. And, uh, always a pleasure. Great to be here. To All right, Thanks. keep right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest right after this. This is theCUBE. We're live from Big Data NYC at Strata and Hadoop World. Right back. <laughs>